All right, hello everyone. My name is Joseph Campbell, and I'm going to talk about a body of work I've made titled Weight. Um, I'd like to start off by asking a simple question, which is, where do we find beauty? Um, in Western cultures like ours, we tend to find beauty in representations of the natural world, of, of reality, of, of, of recreations of the human body, of landscapes. Um, but that's not universal. In, in East Asia, their aesthetic theories tend to derive a lot more from their religious philosophy. Uh, for example, in Zen Buddhist uh, aesthetics, it's meant to symbolize how uh, energies can travel through an environment. And then in some place like West Africa, the sense of beauty comes a lot more from abstraction and patterns. Um, for example, these abstracted human forms on this, uh, this uh, bronze uh, relief from the Kingdom of Benin in the Middle Ages. Um, these are all broad ways that different cultures have derived their own theories of what is beautiful. And um, there are a lot of ways that uh, beauty can be described, that approaches to aesthetic can be described, but I've been taught to think of it in three main categories. The first being imitationalism, where the beauty is found from recreating uh, the real world. For example, this painting from the French Realist movement, which is heavily built around um, imitating the, the lived experiences of everyday people. Uh, but then on the opposite end, you have formalism, which is an approach based around just purely the elements of art. Uh, so this, this painting from the De Style movement, which is just purely line, shape, and color. And then there's a third approach, which is somewhere in the middle called emotionalism, where you're drawing from reality, you're, you're also introducing a higher emphasis on those uh, formal artistic elements, but ultimately where the beauty is found is in the emotion that's being pulled out of the piece, like in this Picasso painting, Guernica, which is meant to uh, show the, the brutality of a, of a city being bombed and destroyed. Uh, my artistic origin story goes back my entire life. As you can see, I've always been something of an artistic prodigy. Uh, there's my first masterpiece. <laughs> Uh, you can see me also reading a book I made to my little sister Katie, shout out to her, over there in the corner. Um, my entire life, basically, I've been making, I've been working with my hands, I've always loved creating and, and, and building things. You know, I was a kid who was super into Legos and Connects when I was a kid. I, I tried writing a book when I was in middle school, you know, I, it's always been a part of me. But while my personal artistic journey goes back to the year 2000, the artistic traditions that I'm drawing on go back hundreds of years. Um, I pull quite heavily from the aesthetics of Japan. Um, their theories are very heavily rooted in, in Zen Buddhism, where you have an example like a rock garden like this, where it's very filled with empty space, uh, these rocks that are scattered throughout the garden. They're positioned so that it's impossible to see all of them from any one angle. Um, and even the practice of maintaining them is meant to be this sort of meditative experience. Um, it's very much focused in this space that you get into as you're creating. Um, and there's this uh, aesthetic theory from Japan called wabi-sabi, which anyone who's taken a class with Jerome has heard many times, um, which basically comes from two concepts. Wabi, which is the beauty of simple things, and sabi, which is the uh, kind of rustic appearance of things that have been affected by time and the elements. And so wabi-sabi is very rooted in beautiful things that are flawed. It's finding beauty in those flaws, in cracks, in blemishes, in malformations, uh, things of that nature. And it's very heavily associated with the simple objects of the people, things like bowls and baskets. Um, and these Japanese aesthetics heavily influenced the abstract expressionist movement uh, of the Western world, and especially the United States uh, in the 50s and 60s. For example, Jackson Pollock, the most famous um, abstract expressionist, his work was using paint not as a way to represent something else, but rather just as a medium unto itself. His work is all about the motion of the paint, the way that the, the physical qualities of paint as a medium, that connectivity with the material that you're using to create the art. Um, and similarly, Peter Volkis, who is probably the most influential ceramicist of the 20th century, uh, he did the same thing with clay. He would make these, these very vessel-like forms, which are you know, the traditional way that clay is used, but then he would distort them until they're just these purely abstract constructions. Um, they're just focused on those formal elements and the clay-like qualities of the material. And so this in turn became heavily influential on the process art movement, which is basically a movement built around the idea that what matters most is not the finished product of the art, but the process of creating it. It's the 
act of creation where the meaning lies. So for example, Bernard Cohen would, would create these paintings where he would start with just a simple idea and he would just repeat that same idea and motion over and over again until he felt like he had a finished piece. Or this piece by Robert Morris where he would cut these felt strips and then just hang them over a nail and the whole thing is created in this instant where it's being hung. Or this, uh, this is very literal process art where it's just a series of photographs of a, a camera taking photographs. It's literally a documentation of the process of photography taken at all these levels of exposure. And easily the most influential process artist on myself is Eva Hess, who uh, was a Jewish woman who was born in Germany in the 30s, whose family escaped to the United States when she was young. And she died tragically young at the age of 34 from a brain tumor. But in her short time creating art, uh, she made this body of work that was very heavily built around play and creating in the moment. She used these simple down-to-earth materials like rope, and it was meant to kind of capture the whimsical state of mind she was in as she was creating. And you know, they, she created these, these brilliant works of art that are just, they capture the motions she was using as she was creating, and they capture the ways that the natural elements uh, affect these materials, the way that they knot together, the way that gravity pulls on them. And so um, this all goes into where I was about a year and a half ago, at the beginning of my junior year. I was at a point in college where I wasn't really, I didn't need to just be making art for classes anymore. It wasn't just to fill out a, an assignment. I needed to start figuring out my own body of work. Who am I as an artist, as a creator? And um, I felt at a massive impasse. I have been terrible always at coming up with end goals. I've always felt paralyzed by the need to have a grand meaning or a grand vision to the point where it gets in the way of me just creating, which is what I really enjoy doing. It's the process of making that, that inspires me. And so Aaron, who was my professor at the time for a sculpture class, uh, he told me after I had spent about a week and a half not making a single thing that <laughs> um, I should just start working with bent lamination, which is a process I had tried before in wood sculpture and really liked. Basically, you take these really thin strips of wood, you glue them together, and then you bend them into these abstract shapes. Um, and I just kept doing that over and over again until I had a giant pile of wood, and there were three days left of the critique, and I had no idea what I was doing with them. So I just started, I hung one up, and I started weaving them between one another and gluing them together and attaching them. And I spent like 13 hours just sitting down, or standing, I should say, attaching all these things together until I had one finished piece. At the time, that was uh, an unusual amount of time for me to spend in the JDAC in a single day. <laughs> um, but eventually, I had this finished piece, which I call Undefined. Um, I was very, at the time, I was creating in a purely formalistic way. I was just worried about line and space and form and these just basic art elements level stuff. Um, but what I found is that I had accidentally created a piece that was a little bit more than just lines and space and shape. Um, as I discovered in my critique with my professor and my classmates, I had accidentally created a piece that was kind of an excellent encapsulation of my own mind. Um, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I'm absurdly anxious and always frazzled and on edge. And uh, this is a piece that's kind of very much that same thing. Um, and so it's kind of a reflection of the state of mind I was in at the time in my life and as I was creating it. And so going forward, I wanted to keep working in that area. So I created this follow-up piece called Uncontrolled. And now that I had a clear idea of how I was working, I was able to kind of work in a bit of a premise of what I wanted to do. So I had this hollow space in the center that I would then wrap all the pieces around that I used I create, used an exercise ball to create, and uh, every piece would loop back around. Unlike the last piece, there were no loose ends. Everything comes back towards this central mass that it's orbiting around, and I was trying to convey focus. And I was really proud of this piece, but I was getting frustrated with wood. Um, with wood, I always felt like I was fighting the, the medium. I, it felt like I was trying to force it to do things that it did not want to do, and that didn't feel great to me. Um, I came into college expecting to work in ceramics, and what I've always loved about working with clay is that it's so malleable and tactile, and there's almost this sense that you don't know where your hand ends and the clay begins when you're working with it. It's, it's, it's very much, you're able to control it intimately. And so I wanted to find a way to use this process that I, that I had started working with 
uh, with ceramic instead. And so uh, this brought me to start experimenting with rings. Um, this is something I had, been, I had been taught how to make in an earlier ceramics class. And it seemed perfect because with the wood, I was just focused on making each individual curve, not thinking about what I would do with it later. And then, I, so it allowed me to just be purely meditative in working with this material. And with this, these rings, I could do the same thing. I could make a single ring, focus heavily on making it, and then worry about later how they're going to be added together. And so it left me, led me to this prototype here, which um, I was quite happy with at the time. It almost felt like it was this dying thing, the way that its body, or the way that its weight was like pulling down on itself, not able to support its own weight. Uh, I did have a problem though, and that's that this was about as big as I could get it. Um, I was restricted by the size of the kiln and by the weight of the material pulling on itself. If you've ever worked with clay, you know that before it's fired, it is very fragile. And so this brings me to the beginning of my senior thesis, where I spent about two months refining a process, figuring out what I was going to do, how I was going to continue exploring this going forward. And ultimately, this is the process I settled on. So step one is throwing. Throwing just means making something on a pottery wheel. I spent, I don't know how many hours at a pottery wheel this year. I, I made, according to my estimates, 335 rings over the course of the year, which is a lot. Um, but it's this very meditative process where I'm just in the moment deciding as I'm working, how big does this ring want to be? How thick do its walls want to be? Uh, at what point do I stop expanding it? How bulbous should it be? These are all decisions that I can make spontaneously. And I, once you get in the motion, you can just go and go and go and just feel this material in your hands and you're not thinking about anything else. Um, and then these would get fired and this would lead me to step two, shattering. I figured if I need to attach these after they're done firing instead of before, I'm gonna need a way to break them open. So I just kind of started grabbing them and dropping them on the ground. <laughs> uh, and they would break into all these pieces and that would be the way I would go forward because after I'm done getting all these textures on them, I can rebuild them back together. Now for firing, normally in ceramics, you build it, then you fire it, then you glaze it, and then you fire it again. I wasn't sure I wanted to glaze this. I was very, I felt very compelled by uh, the clay as the material and to glaze it would almost feel like I was obscuring that clay, obscuring that ceramic behind this layer of glaze. And so I used this firing technique called Raku, which comes from Japan. Um, normally a kiln firing takes about 24 hours plus, uh, a Raku firing takes about an hour. That comes with its dangers. Uh, it can crack and break your pieces intensely, but I was already doing that, so that wasn't going to be a problem. <laughs> um, as you can see, it shoots fire everywhere, uh, which is appealing to me. I'm a bit of a pyromaniac. Um, but mostly what appealed to me about this is that with Raku, after you get it up to its highest temperature, you ease it down a bit, and while it's still over 1,000 degrees, you pull it out of the kiln, and you drop it into a, a pile of leaves, uh, and it burns. And that burning process is normally what activates the glaze, but it, what it does is it creates these really intense, smoky, rustic textures that were perfect for that wabi-sabi thing that was inspiring me. You know, I already had these cracked pieces that had all these gaps in them. And so just this rustic element of, of smoke and, and these grays and blacks and whites that were forming, it all felt so perfect and designed for one another. And so ultimately, I was able to start reconstructing them. As you can see, my face is covered in ash there. Uh, I'm famous at this point for always having dust or clay or iron or steel all over my face constantly. Um, <laughs> it, it, art is not a clean major. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was able to take these pieces, I started building them back together, and as I was reconstructing these broken shards, I could build them into these giant masses. And this process, you know, it's, it's interesting. As I was making these rings, I didn't know what they would be yet. It's only as I'm starting to piece them together that they start to take form and that I can start to see what they want to be. And ultimately this led me to my first three pieces, which I'm calling gravity, collectively. Um, I have been suspending pieces for a while now, and I think what ultimately compels me about it is, is I love seeing pieces being pulled. I love the way that gravity pulls itself on it. Um, I mentioned with those wood pieces that I had accidentally created art that was reflective of my own mind. 
And I think what I've done here is create pieces that feel strung out, pulled apart, and dysfunctional. Uh, it's not quite, not, not quite right. And that middle piece, it's almost like meat being hung from a hook. Uh, it's almost this grotesque quality that I've created, uh, which captures where my mind has been, you know. If you know me intimately, you know that, well, I mean, I'm an artist. My mental health is not great. Um, <laughs> it's kind of what we're known for. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too into it because I, I think the pieces kind of speak to, to it on their own, but these pieces that I've created, by being this meditative reflection on myself, they've become extensions of myself, of anxiety and depression and just feeling crushed by the weight of the world, of the weight of everything. Um, you know, I'm infamous among my thesis group for being the guy who's always causing problems and being late and such. <laughs> They're laughing because they know it's true. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm extremely proud of myself to have finally made it here. This final piece was created in the gallery. I had all of my extra rings. Originally, I was going to use them to make a few pieces, but I just decided to turn them into this big collective unit um, called emaciation, and it's kind of my final extension of myself in this show. Um, to loop this all back around, you know, beauty is deeply subjective. What we find aesthetically pleasing, it's informed by, by both by culture and just who we are as individuals. I can't tell you to find what I do beautiful, but I hope you can understand what, why the process of doing it is beautiful. Thank you. first thing I had dropped. Um, there, there was one time uh, last school year where I was making a giant bowl and it fell apart and so I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to go toss a thing that I didn't like just to let out some anger. And so I knew a bit what I was expecting when I was dropping a piece, but you don't really expect how loud it is initially. Um, I did eventually switch to a process where I was kind of knocking it on the ground. Uh, to break it apart, and that worked a little better. Uh, the first piece broke into about three times more pieces than I wanted, but learning how to break things appropriately is a skill I didn't know I'd be learning how to do, but <laughs> it, it is what I wound up doing. You. Uh, how did you end up putting the pieces back together after, like, to connect it to a chain? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, initially, after I took all the broken pieces out of the Raku kiln, um, I would take the broken pieces, it's a bit like solving a puzzle, so that was fun, uh, and I would reconstruct each ring into just two halves, so that way I had this, all these stacks of rings that were functionally complete, but just yeah, I could split them in two, and so I could take one, I'd glue it, tape it around, and let that dry, take the other, take another ring, it's two halves, wrap it around, glue it, and tape it, and then it just kind of built up from there. a bit more happenstance. Um, that's one thing I found a lot in critiques is that a lot of people initially couldn't even tell what material it was. Some people thought it looked like, some people could tell it was clay, to some people it looked metallic, to some people it looked like rubber. And so the obscuring of the material, I honestly don't know how I feel about it even now. Um, working with clay was so important to this process and yet it's able to convey so many other things. It looks, you know, it's ultimately the textures that I think are the most important thing about where it wound up. I think the ways that I'm working are kind of how I intend to keep working for a while. I can say that at least for the time being, I'm taking a break from clay. I have spent so much time behind a pottery wheel 
And as I went to make those last 30 or so rings, it was difficult to get through it, especially having made, I, I, over our five week block, or our two week block, um, I made 100 rings, like, and I made like 10 a day, and it was a lot. And so taking a break from pottery for a while is necessary. Would you hold up like your display? Oh yeah, I brought a, an example and then completely forgot to use it. Um, as you can see, uh, all the cracks that formed from, from shattering and breaking and the textures. This is one of the more boring ones, which is why it didn't wind up getting used. Um, but you can see you know, the full range of how it forms. I, do you want me to break it? Yes. Do, do people want me to break the ring? It really depends on the size of the ring. Um, ultimately, the process of reconstructing them wound up being a much larger part of the chair than I thought it would be. Uh, the throwing is really where the most variety is. The small ones take 10 minutes. The big ones take like 45. And so I, I'd say on average, each ring across all the stages of development took me maybe 80 to 90 minutes to create on average. Yeah, Evelyn. Yeah. <laughs> and we're doing it in such different ways. And I think it's really cool that even though we have different approaches, we're ending up on the same like, answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on that same topic, uh, Jerome pointed out, and I almost included this, a lot of my paintings are very similar, or a lot of my sculptures are very similar to the paintings of Francis Bacon, who was this uh, post-war painter who made these paintings of like, a lot of like, meat imagery kind of reflecting on the horrors of the Holocaust in World War II. And uh, he was making these paintings that were very like drawing on real life imagery and completely opposite of what I'm doing, yet the feeling you get from them is similar. And yeah, that's just interesting how that works out. Uh, Sam, I'll go first and then. Is there anything, if you had to go back and like do this whole thing again, is there anything that you would change about That's a difficult thing to answer because I want to say, yeah, I wish I had been able to plan more and have a better idea of where I was going with this. But on the other hand, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that that's not something that's ever going to come easily to me. And so I, I don't know if doing it again would have resulted in that. I think more so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do differently. Yeah. So while making this, I don't know if it was easier to deal with necessarily, but I can tell you I've spent, I waited until three hours before a class in order to start writing the paper that was due before it. And, <laughs> on the, and at the same time, I can spend 12 hours a day, five days a week in the JDAP working on this. So I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you always like being dirty? <laughs> That's my dad. He asked that because as a kid I was terrified of dirt. And <laughs> that comes from his father. Yeah. Uh, and yet somehow here I am working in a medium where I spend eight hours a day with mud all the way up to my elbows. I'm not sure how that happened. I still don't like it, but I deal with it now. So. <laughs> Thank you guys. If you wouldn't mind standing up, moving around, get the blood flowing through your body again.